The Last Man and really enjoying it. So I haven't gotten very far into it because I'm mostly just reading it while my students have silent reading. Um, so 15 minutes, three periods a day. But I'm also logging into my computer here. I took an Uber to work this morning and my Uber driver was so interesting. Uh, and I kept thinking like Mary Shelley would be all over this. <laughs> Um, in another month, I might not have been thinking about Mary Shelley, but he was talking about unions and how he drives Uber. He's driven Uber for a long time. He drove Uber while he was also working a full-time job in a warehouse for a very large company that I will not name, not Amazon, not the one you're thinking, but an another very large company that I will not name. And um, they had a union, but they were using, they were buying union members. So they were giving raises here and there and and doing things that were completely skewing the reality of situations. And they were requiring people to work 14 hour shifts and they hadn't given them a raise in over five years. And this individual who's not from this country, I guess I can say where he's from, he was from Vietnam. And he stood up to them and they paid him six months, quote unquote, severance and asked him to sign a non-disclosure agreement. He didn't sign the non-disclosure agreement. I was like, innocent companies, innocent companies don't do that. <laughs> it just made me think about the things that Mary Shelley is writing about, very different, no unions, etc. But the things that Mary Shelley is writing about in The Last Man, the injustice in the world that she saw and how very similar it is to injustice that we still see today. There's a passage early on that sounds just like us. Uh, she's talking about, I mean, she's obviously leading prison reform, leading to prison reform. Um, but she says, the character, <laughs> Mary Shelley, through her main character, says uh, at the end of chapter one, volume one, she says, it was seldom indeed that we escaped, to use an old fashioned phrase, scot-free. Our dainty fare was often exchanged for blows and imprisonment. Once, when 13 years of age, I was sent for a month to the county jail. I came out, my morals unimproved, my hatred to my oppressors increased tenfold, bread and water did not tame my blood, nor solitary confinement inspire me with gentle thoughts. I was angry, impatient, miserable. My only happy hours were those during which I devised schemes of revenge. These were perfected in my forced solitude, so that during the whole of the following season, and I was freed early in September, I never failed to provide excellent and plenteous fare for myself and my comrades. This was a glorious winter. In other words, when I was 13, having been thrown in prison because I had to steal to feed my sister and I, the punishments did not fit the crime. The punishments actually increased his willingness and his ability to commit crimes when the sentence had been served, and also instilled in him a hatred and a distrust for systems, systems that claim to protect and provide. And my car ride today with my Uber driver just made me think about different situation, same problem. That's all, that's all. Talk to your Uber drivers. I know you're taking Uber, just like me. Talk to your Uber drivers, they're so interesting. They're so interesting.
um, in another, <laughs> I took an Uber and got a fun story, uh, check in, which maybe that's what this video is. I don't know. Like, but I was picked up today by a guy who was like, you know, I've been to your school before about a year ago. I, um, picked somebody up at your school and I had just moved here. He's got this really strong Southern accent. He's like, I had just moved here and I was having the hardest time finding a place to live. And I was living in this little month to month place in downtown. And I picked this woman up. Her name was Melinda. Nobody named Melinda works here. <laughs> he was like, I picked this woman up and her name was Melinda. And uh, she had this curly hair and she was like, you know what? Uh, you're taking me to my apartment complex. Let's just take you in there and see if uh, you can get a tour on an apartment and let's let's see if this you know if where I live would be of interest to you and apparently she helped him get an apartment that day in a nice part um, of the greater city area and he still lives there to this day and she said she lived there and the apartment manager knew her uh, but he's never seen her again and no one named Melinda works here and so he's like she was an angel. <laughs> she was an angel. Um, he's absolutely and completely convinced. So uh, there is a fun Uber story for the day. I don't know what it has to do with Mary Shelley, but there you have it. I wanted to check in about The Last Man. I just watched, um, I DVR'd the coronation uh, that happened in the middle of the night for us. Um, and I just finished watching that and it was fascinating. It was so interesting and making me think about The Last Man because in here, uh, this was written in the, in 1822, so in the Regency period, but she talks a lot about the House of Windsor in here. Um, and it, this is written in 1822, but it's set uh, in the 2040s. So closer to us than to itself. And I just think that it's so fascinating that she just keeps referring to the House of Windsor. But in The Last Man, she's not making a lot of predictions about advances in technology or ways that we um, communicate or anything like that. Like it feels very much like it's 1822. It's just the time has passed and different systems, social systems have gotten maybe worse or gone backwards a little bit. There's a lot of commentary right now um, about the justice system, um, the way that the monarchy 
lets people down because they're kind of self-centered and focused on themselves. Um, in it, in the book right now, there is a boy and his sister and they were supposed to be taken care of by the king because of their father's, their now dead father's um, connections to the king, but somehow there's a letter and the letter doesn't, very Shakespearean, doesn't get delivered. Um, and so I'm not even sure if the king is aware of their existence, but they hate the king because they know that he's supposed to have cared for them in honor of the former relationship he had with their father. Um, and their mother dies and they're left to fend for themselves. And the brother needs to take care of the sister and he ends up going to prison for stealing food and things like that. And that just hardens him even more. Um, and everything I've read about this book tells me that that character is actually um, a little bit biographical to Percy Bysshe Shelley, to Mary Shelley's husband. Not that that was his, I mean, he was very, uh, well taken care of as a child. He was very wealthy. Um, so he didn't have that experience, but the way that this character interacts with and thinks about social systems and things like that, um, <clears throat> and turns his back on things that Percy does is, is very much the same. So that's interesting. Um, I also know that there's going to be a pandemic and that that is what's going to wipe everybody out and create the last man scenario that the title refers to. Um, I don't know if he will literally be the last man or on earth, <laughs> or if he's going to be like one of a group, like if he's symbolic of the last group of human beings or whatever, but I know that there's going to be a pandemic that's going to wipe everybody out. And so, yeah, the book is interesting so far. It's a tough read. It's a tough read. It is, not easy language. When she's writing about humanity in her present, her writing is very accessible. And when she's writing historical fiction, she's, she's wrote a book called Valperga, which I still haven't gotten through, um, set in ancient, not ancient Italy, but old, like it's historical fiction to her, um, for her time period set in Italy and maybe Renaissance Italy. I still haven't gotten through that. And when she's writing, about the future, I just, I struggle so much with her writing. I'm now remembering why I've never read this whole book all like from start to finish because it's, it's tough. It's a tough read. Um, I can only get through maybe five or six pages in a sitting before I just need to walk away and think about what I read and try to figure out what she actually said. <laughs> I know what she said. I can understand it as I'm reading it, but what is she really saying? Like it's dense material. And yet you also kind of need a guide through it because there's so many, there's so much insider information. It's like she's writing for her group of people. That's what it feels like. She feels like, it feels like she's writing for her group. At this, by this point in her life, at the writing of this, most of her group is dead, has been disbanded. And most of her children are dead as well. She's got one son who makes it to adulthood. And so she's, I think she's feeling pretty lonely while she's writing this. And I haven't read this, but I'm just kind of inferring from what I know about her life. But I just think that uh, there's so much in here. She's, she's trying to re-enliven through these characters, pieces of herself and her youth. Uh, her husband, who's now dead, Byron, who's now dead, her, um, her sister-in-law, like she's just trying to give them life. And I do know this, I know that around the time that she started writing The Last Man, she had been previously asking for permission uh, from Percy Bysshe's father, Percy Bysshe Shelley's father, to write a biography of her husband, her late husband, and he would not, the estate would not give her permission to do that, and they never do give her permission to do that. And so The Last Man is kind of a completely and utterly fictional biography of 
her husband. So he is also the last man. And we know she never remarries. She never even thinks about anything like romance, again, that we know of that she writes of. So I think that there's a lot more going on with this book for her personally. And that makes it a little bit tough to decipher sometimes what she's really trying to say, because it's kind of like full of inside jokes, but they're not funny, like inside information uh, between her and her inner circle. And it doesn't quite translate to the outside world some of the time. So it is a difficult read. It just is. I think it's a worthwhile read though. I did read one thing that was saying that this was, this was completely panned by um, critics of her day because she had jumped on a bandwagon. She'd, she'd followed a trend. There were a lot of last man books and short stories and plays being produced at this time um, about the end of the world, these dystopian futures where everything will rely, like the regeneration of humanity will rely on the ideals and the health and the purposes of one human being. It should be two, but one human being. Um, and can they rebuild? Who will rebuild? What kind of person will be left? Who can rise to the top? And what does that mean about the kind of world they will usher in uh, when the rest of the world, the previous world, has died? So everybody got, everybody, all the critics got quite upset with her for jumping on this bandwagon, the last man band bandwagon. But she remained, because it is her darling, it is her story of her husband and her friends and herself in her youth, she remained, it's like, it remained one of her absolute favorite books that she'd ever written. So all of that is fascinating. I am only uh, 83 pages in. I'm 83 pages in, a little bit ahead of schedule for the read along, uh, which has turned into, the read along has turned into more of a buddy read and that's all good. <laughs> that's totally fine. I understand that if people were a little bit put off by The Last Man, I think it's a great challenge. I think it's gonna be well worth the effort that it took to read. Uh, I'm glad that there's, uh, you know, a couple of people to discuss with, one in Discord and a couple over in Instagram who are wanting to discuss. And I know that a lot of you are wanting to see the final result and hear how it went. Um, I received several messages of that, like, sort of spirit. So thanks to those of you who did that. Um, and any way you participate or, or you know, check in is A-OK -okay with me. Uh, I would be doing this even if nobody was doing it, but it's more fun to do it with people, right? Anyway, that is what I'm reading, but I am also reading one of my biographies of contemporaries of Mary Shelley. So I'm reading The Case of the Married Woman, Carolyn Norton, a 19th century heroine who wanted justice for women by Antonia Frazier. And I am 77 pages into this at the moment. Actually, Mary Shelley was one of her friends. Like I knew that Mary Shelley was friends with a woman who um, had a similar situation that she had met in in Italy. And that woman was living in Italy with her significant other and their children, but she had had to leave her English husband and all of her English children behind. And she had started a new life. And she had fought for years to try to get her children. I can't remember this woman's name right now, but if I were not so if I were willing, let's say, I could go and find the book that um, has the introduction that talks about this woman and tell you her name. Because uh, she had quite a famous case in England. And so does this woman. And I thought Mary Shelley knew her, but I wasn't absolutely sure if I was just kind of superimposing that story onto Caroline Norton. Uh, because I know they're different. But Mary Shelley actually did know Caroline Norton and was friends with Caroline Norton. And as Caroline is losing custody of her children, she is in, she is in um, communication through letters with Mary Shelley, who finds, of course, her situation uh, atrocious. And Mary Shelley, being the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft, uh, is very much about Lola. She did 
know her. And so um, I'm at a point in the story where Mary Shelley and her are exchanging letters and um, Mary Shelley's being quoted a lot. So I'm like, yes, not only a contemporary, but like a contemporary of Mary Shelley. And this woman, I mean, it feels like when you read Little Miss, what are you doing? Please don't chew on the dirt that's in the pot. Please don't chew on the dirt that's in the pot. When you read about Carolyn Norton's life, she's like living in London and she's been raised um, in the highest of society, which also Mary Shelley could have been, but wasn't. Um, and well, maybe not the highest of society, but she could have had like a quote unquote normal circle of friends and that is not what she wanted. Um, but Carolyn Norton is, she like holds salons in London and she's really good friends with all sorts of very influential and important people, including people very close to the monarchy. She gets, she falls in love with somebody who dies, probably wouldn't have been allowed to marry him anyway, but she probably would have tried to do a love match. And uh, he was a military officer. And after he dies, she there's hints and letters, diaries and things where she just kind of gives up and just marries who she's told to marry, who she's supposed to marry, um, instead of instead of being a uh, single instead of, uh, at that time, which would have been atrocious for her, um, instead of hi, did you want to make a case for digging in the palm tree pot? Oh, did you want to sit in my lap? Is this, is that what's happening right now? Um, hi, what's happening right now? Do you have a plan? <laughs> Do you have a plan? What's your plan? Huh? Oh, oh, reading about her life. It feels like she lives in a different time period than Mary Shelley does. But she doesn't. She lives in the exact same time period as Mary Shelley. Um, and it feels like she lives in a different place than Mary Shelley. Like their lives, although at the same time, are so incredibly contrary to each other. Um, th just like thinking about the kinds of people they're friends with and the kinds of ways they spend their time and the ways that, that they use society. Yet they're both strong women. They both want love. They both want autonomy. They both write. Carolyn Norton is also a writer. They both who they both are rejected in different ways from larger society for different reasons. And they kind of see the politics and things like that, social reform, very differently from each other, very differently from each other. And yet that bond of entrapment that women feel at this time, uh, because they literally, this book makes such a good point um, of explaining that when a woman marries, she not only becomes, like we've all heard this, you know, women were the property of the men in their lives, uh, the property of their husband or whatever, but she disappears. Marriage erases her identity. So every penny that Carolyn Norton or Mary Shelley made while being married to their husband actually belonged to their husband and never belonged to them. Political thought that they had could only have impact or voice in society if their husband also thought that and spoke it or voted it. Every piece of property they owned became their husband's. They owned nothing, not their children, not their wardrobe, not their toothbrush, nothing. Nothing belonged to them and they had no rights. And so when Carolyn Norton ends up going to court, and this is before, this is before divorce was a thing. So if you were very, very wealthy, you could get, I believe it's the House of Commons or somebody to dissolve your marriage if you were very, very, very wealthy and could make a case. But what was more likely was that you would accuse your spouse of infidelity and then you would make your case before the court and then you would 
you would win a case. What do they call it? Something conversation. I don't remember, but the crime is something about conversation, but it's not really about conversation. It's like a euphemism. Uh, but you would win, win or lose that legal case. When she is taken to court, because her husband, who she just doesn't obey him. And he freaks out. He's abusive, physically abusive, and also emotionally and mentally abusive. And she leaves. She says she's going to take the children. And he takes the children and sneaks them off to family members of his. And she's no longer allowed to see them. And so she's trying to make amends so that she can get a plan to go back to him and... and um, be with him until she can get her children snuck away with her. He supersedes all of this by accusing her of what by accusing a man, a very important man, uh, a man who will become Lord Melbourne. Uh, he is Lord Melbourne, but he will become the advisor to Queen Victoria. And uh, he's so kind of like flirty and, and wild, and I kind of always imagined him like the Scarlet Pimpernel, <laughs> like an old the Scarlet Pimpernel. He, you know, he's he's got so much bravado, and uh, that even Victoria will be accused of um, having an inappropriate relationship with him, and it, he doesn't, it, not with any of these women, with other women, but not with these women, not with Caroline Norton, not with Queen Victoria, and there's plenty of of proof that he doesn't. But because she has a friendship with him, her husband accuses him of having these dishonorable conversations. That's not what it's called, but it's something like that. And when her her court case goes to court, she's not allowed to represent herself, to say anything on her own behalf. She literally accepts to be um, accused of having been used by someone else in some way who is not her husband, except for being part of that accusation, she doesn't exist. She cannot speak on her own behalf. She cannot even make a statement that says, you know, I am innocent. She can't bring forth private correspondence because it doesn't exist. He could, Lord Melbourne could, and he kind of does, but she doesn't exist because she's married. She's cloaked. She's winged. Um, and Mary Shelley benefited from that in a way, uh, when her husband left his wife to be with her and that wife had no recourse and ended up killing herself as a result. And Mary Shelley, I think, always felt just a little bit guilty about that. Read her letters. Read her letters. She also felt great joy because she got to be with the man she loved, was obsessed with. Um, it's all so interesting. It's all so interesting. But Mary Shelley and Catherine and Caroline Norton are two women with very little in common, except for the fact that they are both women limited by the society in which they live. And Mary Shelley, because she's widowed young, has more freedom within society. But she also is associated with some notorious and radical thinkers. And so she's not necessarily respected in society, although people also idolized those radical thinkers a, lo a lot. Lord Byron, I mean. Anyway, anyway, I'm rambling, but the reading is going well. I'm enjoying myself. I'm especially enjoying reading about a contemporary of Mary Shelley. This is a great book. Um, it reads very quickly and very easily. Uh, not, it doesn't read like fiction, but it's definitely told in a narrative style. And um, I knew that I would not, I knew that I would get along with Antonia Frazier because I've read her huge, her thick um, biography of Marie Antoinette. So I, I knew if I, could, if I could enjoy that, I would probably enjoy this shorter work as well. And I can't wait to get my hands on the new book that she is releasing this summer about Caroline Lamb. I'm gonna read my Caroline Lamb 
biography from the 70s that I have over there, but I really want to hear Antonia Fraser's take. Uh, anyway, that is my update for right now, and um, yeah, now that she's chill, maybe I'll get to read a little bit. Just walking home and wanted to do a quick check-in about uh, Carolyn Norton but <laughs> as I'm doing this I'm realizing it's so hot so uh, I'll see you inside in a moment. just got back from seeing um, Lydia and the Troll at a local repertory company. Um, this is written by a guy named Justin Huartes and it was just phenomenal. It was so much fun. It is so in in the city where I live, this will give away where I live, <laughs> in the city where I live, there is this um, troll under a bridge. Uh, it's a big sculpture under a bridge. And so the, basically this is like a musical fable built around the idea, the concept of this troll. And in the musical, um, there's a troll that every 20 years has to change bodies. It goes in and out of different human bodies in order to live life and it, to, in order to enter a human body, it just has to get that human to tell it something, some deep, dark secret that it has, um, some truth. For example, one of the truths that is revealed is that one of the characters feels like he's inferior to his brother, that kind of deep, dark truth, something that he definitely feels but has not given voice to. And then in discussions and interactions with the troll, uh, is then made to give, give voice to. And then the troll can take advantage of that moment and jump into that person's body and gets 20 years before it has to jump into another person's body, but it can jump into another person's body whenever it wishes and can get a person to reveal one of those deep, dark secrets. And so this is, there's, the troll has run out of time in its current body and it's been following and watching, looking for candidates for its next body. And it tends to want to choose, this particular troll tends to want to choose uh, artists of some sort, ballerina, sculptor. It's a musician this time. So there's a musician who feels pretty negatively about herself. Um, she wants to win this grant that's um, that she has a chance to win. And she feels less than and inferior because of the the social programming her mother gave her about her black hair. Um, she's a black woman and her mother made her feel othered because of her hair. This is, this is a very direct way of saying what is revealed in this story, which is not direct at all. And so she feels less than, she feels inferior, she feels like the color of her skin is going to limit her access to, to, to the possibility of winning this grant. She, it was a multi-step process. She got through the first step and she thinks she only got through the first step because she has talent, but they only saw that talent because it was a completely non-visual, like 
contribution. And so they feel like in the next step when she has to sing in front of not judges, but oh, adjudicators, they, they called it adjudicators. When she has to sing in front of the adjudicators uh, and they can see that she is a black woman, she fears that that will cut her out of the running. And the troll picks up on her lack of love for herself and that lack of love for herself, meaning that she's really kind of incapable of loving anyone else as well. Um, truly, she gets her to admit that. And then the troll takes over her body. And it's this great romp about how she is going to get her body back and fall in love with herself, like who she is and have acceptance of herself. And it was just, it's very serious. Like obviously I'm telling you a very serious like storyline here, right? Like it's very hard hitting, but the presentation, it's got puppets and lighting and uh, it, it moves, it plays with shadows and it has these moving um, see-through walls that they make silhouettes on. And it is just, they interact with the audience. It was just so fun. And it's a musical. And there's just two people playing all of this live music off stage. Like you can see them because it's like they're in a, um, a apartment complex. And so it looks like they're behind a window in their apartment playing these musical instruments, but they're doing all of the like backup music and all of the electronic music and everything. And you can see it happening right there, these two people. Um, it was brilliant. If you can't tell, I'm super excited about it. It was so good. And I hope that it can go further than just like local repertory theater. Like I think this has potential to be amazing, amazing. So, uh, be on the lookout for Lydia and the Troll if it ever like travels. I mean, I really think, I really think it should. I think it's excellent. It was such a great experience. It was 90 minutes without intermission and I couldn't believe that we had reached the end already. Like seriously, it felt like 20 minutes. It was so fast <laughs> um, and delightful. Absolutely delightful. You, you left, you left feeling uplifted. Um, and I just, it's also a great little fable for the place that we live. Like it was just, everything about it was just really, really wonderful. Um, yeah. Anyway, just got back from that. Uh, while I'm here and ooing and awing about Lydia and the troll, I will also say that I am still reading The Last Man, but I also just finished reading A Life with Mary Shelley by Barbara Johnson. These are very academic, uh, a collection of essays and a longer work, I'd say maybe like novella length, but it's nonfiction, um, about the study of Mary Shelley. And uh, Barbara Johnson's doing these, writing these and studying Mary Shelley uh, in a time and a moment when Mary Shelley had kind of fallen off of the radar of the literary world. She was respected, of course, for Frankenstein, but was kind of seen as a one-off. She was respected more for whose daughter she was. She was respected more for whose wife she was. This, this woman, Barbara Johnson, was like, actually, uh, we have to think about Mary Shelley as the brilliant literary genius that she is and here's why and here's her literary genius and here's how and so for example I was very one of the things that stood out to me the most were her writings on The Lost Man in, or The Last Man in particular because The Last Man is the book that we are reading right now for the Betty Read. She was talking about the marginalization of Mary Shelley's main characters and how that mirrors the marginalized life that Mary Shelley always had to live. She was always on the margin for one reason or another, never fully accepted, never fully pulled in, never fully excluded, um, but never fully respected either. And that carried on into her fame after death. Um, yeah. Anyway, it was fascinating. It's great stuff. I don't know that I can recommend it to everybody because again, it is very academic. Um, but I think that this is a very important book to have. It's, it is academic, but it is also oddly personable, 
personal, I will say, maybe. It's oddly personal to Barbara Johnson. It feels almost like it is a life with Mary Shelley. Like, it feels almost like through her unearthing of Mary Shelley's genius and her advertising of Mary Shelley's genius, um, she is unearthing her own self. And so it is both this collection of brilliant insights, thoughtful ponderings, academic essays on Mary Shelley, but you don't lose Barbara Johnson. Like she's right there finding herself the whole way as well. Um, it's not a memoir, but I think it's maybe listed as, it maybe could be listed a little bit as a memoir because it is her, it's her and what's important to her through the lens of Mary Shelley. Um, yeah, anyway, I brought a toy home for her and she's already destroyed all the tassels on it and I've only been home for about 10 minutes and 46 seconds. <laughs> um, anyway, she did great. She did great today. She did not destroy anything while I was gone. So it made coming home even more fun <laughs> to know that I went out and I had a great time and I brought her back a toy hoping that she hadn't destroyed anything. She hadn't destroyed anything. She got her toy and I don't have to clean up the whole world. Um, so that is awesome. And now she can destroy her toy. <laughs> uh, I'm about to start my imaginary Mary, which is just going to be a fun romp. Nothing serious about this at all. If you've not read any of these Mary books that, or Jane books, then I highly suggest that you pick them up. There's the Janes and there's the Marys. There's two Marys out. There's, um, there's, uh, my contrary Mary and my imaginary Mary. I have not read my contrary Mary. I skipped straight to my imaginary Mary. And I know that that means that I'll miss a few Easter eggs, but that's fine. Um, they can also be read as standalones, but then there are the Jane books, which started it all. There's My Lady Jane, My Plain Jane, and My Calamity Jane. My Plain Jane is my favorite one of those because it's about Jane Eyre, um, but they're all super fun books, and if you haven't read them, you just know they all start with an apology <laughs> to the country and the people that they're about and take place in uh, because they rewrite history and they take fiction and nonfiction and they put them together and they make things different. Um, and it's just going to be fun, silly, starring Mary Shelley and Ada Lovelace and an AI that they create that they call Pan, uh, which I think you can't not make a connection between the god Pan and Pan. Uh, anyway, I'm going to start reading that today. And uh, first, I'm going to get some food because I am absolutely starving. I'm starving. I'm just I'm starving starving. this video up. So I just woke up. It's very early. It's 
not even seven o'clock in the morning yet and I want to wrap this up so that I can edit and film and get this out there. Um, I want to say that I finally read Mad Mary Lamb. This was a priority read for me because I've had it on my TBR shelf since 2015. Uh, this is the one, it is a contemporary of Mary Shelley. It's another biography and it's about Mary Lamb who with her brother Charles wrote Tales for Shakespeare. So these are retellings of most of Shakespeare's romantic and dramatic plays like his tragedies, not so much his histories, but his tragedies and his comedies and his romances. It's the, the stories are retold for young audiences as stories as opposed to plays and they simplify the language. Charles is the only one who had his name on it and sometimes you can still get copies that only have Charles's name on it even though Charles was very quick to say that Mary Lamb did almost all of the rewriting. Charles already had a literary career. He was a well-known essayist and nonfiction writer. He wrote social commentary and he was highly respected. He was friends with, here's the connection to Mary Shelley, um, he was friends with Mary Shelley's father who was a publisher and also a real forward thinker and mover and shaker in society at the time or a social reformer. Mary had a psychotic episode in her 30s. She was taking care of her invalid mother, her invalid father, her recently injured older brother, not Charles, another one and training a young, I believe about seven year old serving girl, as well as caring for Charles. And she'd been doing this her whole life and she didn't have a whole lot of hopes and dreams for herself. They were an impoverished family. They had grown up, her father having a good job that gave them good places to live. And it was still a, he was a server at a um, barrister's I think college, but it meant any, and, but he was the favorite and he served the same man for like 30 years or so. And it meant that they got a lot of care and they didn't really feel like they were in the strata of society that they actually were. And when that man died, they lost everything. She could remember when she wasn't the one <laughs> having to do all the things. In her thirties, right around dinner time, she has a psychotic episode and she stabs her mother to death right before dinner, her invalid mother. People witness it and speak to it and she doesn't remember it. And because of their connections, she's not put on trial or anything like that. Instead, she is immediately deemed a lunatic and put into an asylum. So don't think Bedlam, it's not that. It's it's a hospital, it's truly a hospital for the insane. After a few years, she was released um, to her brother Charles's care. Charles is her younger brother, but as I said, he was established, he was well known, he was respected, he had high, uh, well, not maybe high class, but he had influential friends. And so because of all of these connections and because it seemed to be something that she didn't have control over and she couldn't remember, she didn't pre-plan, she didn't, she didn't intend, <laughs> she was released and never had another psychotic break again, cared for her brother, Charles, and he never married and she never married and he died and she lives on for decades after him. And Charles was always very quick to say, that she was the one who did all of this work for this and she didn't get her name put on it or anything until recently and even now. I just on Book Outlet saw a copy that only has Charles's name on it, but it was really Mary's work. Yeah, so Mad Mary Lamb. I finally read it. <laughs> I finally read it. Uh, it's an interesting biography. I don't think it's very, I, th I think it's out of print. I don't think that it's very easy to get. Uh, there are some copies on Book Outlet. I mean, not Book Outlet, sorry. On Better World Books. I believe there's probably copies on Abe Books. But it's not the kind of thing that you're going to go to Barnes & Noble and find. And then I read this one, uh, My Imaginary Mary. This is just a completely silly um festive romp through Regency England. It is uh, the story of 
Okay, so in my review, I compared it to improv. <laughs> it's a lot of yes and. It, it questions what if Ada Lovelace and Mary Shelley were the same age? Um, Ada Lovelace is the daughter of Lord Byron, uh, born of his first marriage. And um, Mary Shelley is, of course, Percy Shelley's wife. <laughs> <laughs> um, not the same age at all. Uh, but it asks what if they were the same age and what if they were friends and what if they invented an AI that, um, or a automaton, a, a robot, an intelligent life form. <laughs> What if they created a um, automated life form that could think for itself? They name it Pan. Troubles and excitement ensue from there. There are fairies. <laughs> this is a suspension of reality of the utmost level. <laughs> and it is just fun. It's just fun. It's a whole series. It starts with the Janes. There are three Jane books and then it goes to the Marys. There are currently two Marys. I don't know what the third Mary will be, but I'm sure it will be fun. They are all do this. They all do this. So it starts with My Lady Jane. I highly suggest that if you enjoy laughing a lot and um, and unique ways to honor literary and feminist heroines of the past um, and of fiction, <laughs> then maybe look into these because these are quite fun. They are YA. They do read YA. But they also read so ridiculous that it doesn't really matter. Very fun. This one, all about Mary Shelley. And then, yes, I did finish The Last Man. I am the last man to finish The Last Man. <laughs> um, I started with a very small group of people. It was more like a buddy read. I think I've already mentioned that here. I uh, started with a very small group of people. Um, one person in Discord, a few people in Instagram. Someone does not want me to film today. <laughs> so, um, one person on Discord, and thank you, I love you too. And a few people on Instagram in direct messaging, and we were discussing what we were reading about halfway through the second book, the second section. Oh my goodness, Lola. I lost a lot of speed. And, um, <laughs> about halfway through the second section, I lost a lot of steam <laughs> and almost gave up. If I hadn't been doing, um, if this hadn't been the buddy read, I definitely would have DNF'd. Um, but as it was, and as it took until I was in the third section for everyone else to DNF, <laughs> slowly but surely they fell away. And yes, I get the irony of that because we're reading a book about a pandemic that causes everyone to die except for one person. I am the last man. Yeah, I gave this book two stars. Um... I love Mary Shelley, and there are some really great things in this book. There truly are. I There are some great moments, but it's so hard to read. I think I said before, um, but I want to reiterate that it is so full of, like, inside information. You really need an annotated copy of this book, I think, in order to understand what's really being said, like annotated by a professional <laughs> um, to really understand what's being said, like a Mary Shelley scholar needs to walk you through this. It's the kind of book that would be great to be taught in a class. It would be really great to be taught in a class. The language was also 
very, very difficult to decipher at times. Um, at times you could just be reading and, and read 10 pages and not even realize it. And then she would get really like twisty with her sentence structure and or sentences would go on for multiple pages. A sentence. If you're going to read this book, if you're going to read Mary Shelley, don't start here. <laughs> That's what I'll say. Um, Frankenstein is superior writing and I think it's just because she was younger and she didn't have time to perfect her style yet. Because I have tried to read another by her that reminded me very much of this and it's from her later era of writing um, called Valperga. And it, I DNF'd it for the very same reason. The story itself is quite interesting and the characters are very, very interesting. I think character is one of her strongest points, character development and setting, um, and making the setting and the, making the setting be a major influence on the story, not just where things happen, but why things happen, um, I think is some of her gold. And um, she does that still, she still does that in The Last Man, it's there, but I think The Last Man was just too close to her own heart and it's just got too much in it that she's trying to say, she's trying to make corrections to romanticism. She's trying to honor the memories of people that she loved that also harmed her. We're talking Shelley and Byron. She's just got a lot of really complicated memories, feelings, and emotions that she's also trying to fictionalize. And she's trying to speak to all of society, but really it's more like she's working out her own stuff. I think that it's just too much if you don't know her own stuff. Um, and I know a lot about her and I was lost a lot of the time. Um, maybe I wasn't lost. Maybe it's just a really poorly written book, but I don't think so. I think that everything that drove me the craziest is probably the the most meaningful, but I just don't get it. I don't understand the code. And she does do codes. This is not a new thing. Like Frankenstein is also full of codes. If you look at all of the dates, they match up in Frankenstein. It's a it's partly a uh, partly epistolary. And if you look at all the dates in Frankenstein, they match up with the major dates. Uh, in her own life, as far as her mother's birth and death, her birth, um, the death dates of her children, they all are interestingly um, equated. So she does these things and she doesn't tell you that she's doing these things. And so I know, I know that the things that are driving me the most crazy, like I just have that knowing that the things that are driving me the most crazy in The Last Man are probably the things that are of the most value, but I don't have the knowledge I need. I don't have the ciphers to break the code. And I think that there's a reason why she loved it the most. And that reason is because it's most deeply her. Um, she's most deeply expressing herself through this in a weird convoluted way. Um, but that makes it very, very, very difficult for the rest of us to make heads or tails of it. In her day, did I already talk about this? I don't remember, but in her day, um, it was panned by critics because there was a whole, um, she like jumped on the bandwagon of last man stories. There, these were very popular in that moment and she didn't lead the way, she kind of tailed the way, but she saw it as an opportunity to tell her husband's story and um, kind of immortalize him or aim to immortalize him. And I mean, you can definitely see that in in the book. Um, there's also lots of fun things, like there's marriages that don't work out and women that are driven insane and parents that are awful and society, you know, that mistreats people. Like there are lots of things in there that are very intriguing to read about. The storyline itself is quite intriguing. A little bit hard to wrap your uh, believability around. It's a little bit unbelievable at times. Um, but what dystopian book isn't? Yeah, there's a lot to be recommended, a lot to recommend it, uh, but the the language itself and the fact that just so much, so much of it is so, what is a word? 
opaque, obtuse. I'll have to look that word up. I don't know if that me word means what I think it means. <laughs> but it's just so hard to decipher at times. Um, I'm not sorry I read it. I don't think it's a bad book. I just didn't like it. <laughs> I just didn't like my experience with it. Um, and nobody else did either. So sorry everyone um, who attempted to read that with me and then DNF'd. I took you down a difficult trail. I took you up a high mountain and um, I do not judge you for turning around. <laughs> Anyway, this concludes Mary Shelley May 2023, and um, I will be back in 2024 with more Mary Shelley May. I will not make you all read The Last Man next year. <laughs> I don't want to return to Frankenstein either, though, so maybe we'll read Matilda. That's a real short one and also quite disturbing. I've already read it, and I know it's highly readable. So... Maybe we'll go that we'll go that direction. I don't know, um, but thank you, thank you. If you've watched this entire video, you're a superstar, and um, yeah, let's go read. Bye.